So it seems like it's been a month since we were back in the Gospel of John. So I'm going to have to help remind us, myself included, where we left off. Now we'll be in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verses 37 through the end of the chapter. If you recall, Jesus had visited the temple in Jerusalem during the middle of the week of the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a week-long celebration. We studied a little bit about that. Jesus was teaching in the temple. He had some things to say about eternal life. Now we come to the end of that feast, and we'll pick it up in verse 37. But I'd like to point out that in these verses, we will see three main points that I'd like you to be aware of as we're reading the scripture to see if you can track along with these three points. The first is the offer of the Savior. We'll see the opinion of, of the seekers, and then the opposition of the scorners. Those are the three points that we'll see in these verses, and we'll get into it in a little bit more detail as we go on. But starting in verse 37, on the last day of the feast, so now Jesus showed up in the middle of the feast to have his teaching in the tabernacle. Now, this is at the end of the week, last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and has come from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him, and some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see, no prophet arises from Galilee. So a lot going on there. And if we remember back and look back, A couple of weeks ago, the Pharisees had commanded the officers to arrest Jesus. And yet, because it was not Jesus' time to be arrested, they could not. The Lord supernaturally intervened in that to prevent them from arresting him. We look first at the offer by the Savior. And I just want to point out in verse 38, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, Now, it's important to note that there's a difference between as the scripture has said and it is written. When Jesus is quoting scripture specifically, he'll say it is written or is it not written in that hypothetical. But when he says scripture has said, he's not quoting scripture, but he's interpreting or applying scripture. That's the difference. When we see Jesus say, has scripture said, we're not going to find that specific quote in the Old Testament. But the application, the interpretation of specific verses, we'll find that in there. So I just want to point that out. And he's promising the Holy Spirit. If his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's about the Spirit. If the Lord gives the Spirit to all believers, all who believe in him, which he does, it's important to find out why. Why would he give us the Spirit? There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a purpose. And so we're going to look at a few of those. Teaching outline number one, God's purpose in giving every believer the indwelling Holy Spirit is for him to be poured out in multiple streams, rivers of living water, to others and not as a cistern to be collected and stored. Now a cistern is the holding tank for water. Jesus is very clear, rivers of living water, multiple rivers, not just a river, not a babbling brook, not just a little trickling stream, but rivers of living water. And not like the washes that we have here in Arizona that look like a raging rapid 
one day and within hours could dry up to just be damp. That's not how the Holy Spirit operates in the lives of believers. It's intentional, it's deliberate, and sustainable. Rivers of living water. This notion of rivers of living water is that we're to have an impact on everyone we come in contact with. That means our spouses, our family members, friends, our co-workers at the job, fellowship with believers or outreach with unbelievers. No matter where we go, we are to have that impact. Just because we're cozy with fellow believers is not sufficient because the Lord wants us to be those rivers in all aspects of our life. That also means we're not supposed to be secluded. This idea of a holy huddle of the frozen chosen or, you know, this fortress mentality where we're going to hunker down and get into our Christian bunker and not engage with the world because the world is a scary place. That is not biblical. No rivers of living water can flow when it's just in a holding tank. We're kind of unique in that regard is that we are constantly looking for ways to reach out to others with the truth. And that's as it should be. Isaiah 58, 11, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. That's one of the verses that Jesus was referring to when he was talking about these rivers of living water. Again, not a direct quote, but an interpretation and application of scriptural truth. We are to interact with others and impact them in a deliberate way. But the Christian life is impossible to live out on our own. We can't do what scripture commands us to do on our own strength. We can do some of it, depending on our personalities and proclivities and personality strengths. Some things are easier to do than others in our own strength, but we can't do the whole thing on our own. Even with the power of the Holy Spirit, is still a process of sanctification. We're growing in that. But an unbeliever could not do what Scripture has commanded us to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. So that leads us to number two. Second reason for the Holy Spirit is that God the Holy Spirit empowers believers to live a life that is pleasing to God. The Lord doesn't call us to do something that he hasn't already equipped or will equip us to do. He's called us to be obedient and live a righteous life. Well, he's empowered us to do that. He's not commanding us and then sitting back and saying, I would like to see you do that. Go ahead. He never sets us up for failure. Never. Never. But here's the challenge. Sometimes we're called before we're equipped. And our response could be doubt or anxiety. Really? Lord, you called me to do this because I don't feel equipped. And maybe we're not equipped yet. When the calling comes first, he'll give you the equipping. He'll give me the equipping at the time we need it. But sometimes the calling kind of leads before we sense the equipping. And so we have to deal with that uncertainty and that doubt. The flip side is sometimes we're equipped before we sense the call. And then we have to wrestle with patience. Hey, I'm equipped to do this. All right, Lord. And he says, not now. Yes, I've equipped you. That's the right thing, but not now. Very rarely do we sense and realize the calling and the equipping at the same time. That's the best time. It's like, hey, all right, you called me to do this, and bam, I'm equipped. But oftentimes it's one or the other that we sense before the other one. We'll either be exercising patience or wrestling with doubt and uncertainty. But the Lord always equips us for the things that he's called us to do. I think a good example of that is here in Second Peter chapter 1. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires." I mean, that just sums it up right there. Even though we're in the mix and in the midst of a sinful world, we have the power of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live righteously. And we have to acknowledge that. There's an easy beliefism that says, oh, once you ask Jesus into your heart, that's enough. You're saved. That's it. 
and that is called antinomianism, where nothing is required to demonstrate obedience to the Lord. But we are called and equipped to live a righteous life, to live according to the scriptures. We're going to fall short, but that doesn't give us license to stay where we are. We have to press forward. That's our responsibility. The Holy Spirit will empower us. The Holy Spirit is there to give us those opportunities to exercise the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. But we have to respond. We have a responsibility in that as well. It just doesn't happen by itself. And there are some who believe it does. Oh, just love Jesus, which is good. We should love the Lord. But he says, if you love me, obey my commands. It always results in action, always in a response, not just a feeling, but a response to what is already in our hearts. If you would, please turn to Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to see another example of this with the Spirit. We can just go weeks and weeks and weeks on the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer and all of the aspects of the Holy Spirit's ministry. But we're just going to have to touch upon it just slightly this morning. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This is Paul writing to the church in Galatia. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And so in those verses we see that the flesh and the spirit are mutually exclusive. They're incompatible. We're either walking in the flesh or we're walking in the spirit. There's no middle ground. That can change moment by moment. I'm sure you've all experienced that. One moment, we're right in line with God's will and praise God and we're doing the right thing and, and saying the right things. And then the next minute, we say the wrong thing and sin and we have fleshly anger at somebody or something when just a moment before we had a righteous attitude. It can happen that quick, but there's no straddling the fence. You can't have both simultaneously. It's one or the other, the flesh or the spirit. And Paul writes about the fruit of the spirit. We think about fruit on a tree. It's what the tree produces. The fruit of the Spirit in us is what the Spirit in us produces. So we look at that list of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are an outpouring of the Holy Spirit working in us. When we're walking in the Spirit, that fruit is produced. When we're walking in the flesh, that doesn't happen. And that's one way to tell if we're walking in the Spirit or not. If our actions are not resulting in any of those fruit of the Spirit, then we're not. He does empower us to live a life that's pleasing to Him. We can't do anything for God to love us more, or we can't do anything to make Him love us less, but we can do things that please Him. Number three, the Holy Spirit gives believers spiritual gifts that are to be used in ministering to others. And this is a whole package deal, this salvation thing. <laughs> Not only do we get our sins forgiven completely and a home in heaven, but now we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us and empowers us and gives us gifts on top of that. I'm not speaking only for myself, I think, when I say we need to be spending more time dwelling on that, that the Holy Spirit has richly given us these gifts for caring for others and ministering to others. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them in all, in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So this is kind of an extension of points number one and number two. The empowerment to minister to others is through the gifts of the Spirit. You might wonder, well, what are my gifts? What are my spiritual gifts? And there's a variety of lists within the New Testament that describe what the gifts of the Spirit are. 
Lord willing, we'll have an opportunity to study them in a little bit more specificity in the Discover Discipleship Seminar. We'll talk about that because that's one of the elements of being a disciple of Christ, is identifying and using the spiritual gifts that he's given us. Once we identify what gifts we appear to have, that is a clue as to what he wants us to do. If he's given us a gift of hospitality, then he's probably going to want to open our home up at one point or another. If he's given us the gift of helps, we'll be put in a situation where we can help others. That would be good to study, the gifts of the Spirit. And they have various questionnaires and checklists, and, and some of them are good, some of them are goofy. I, I, I think it's a good endeavor. Seek the Lord. What are your gifts? Look back at the opportunities that the Lord has given you, so you can look at his track record of where has he placed you in. That could reveal what your gift is. Sometimes it's the flip side. Sometimes we know what our gift is, and then we go look for opportunities to use that gift. Other times, well, I don't know what my gift is. And yet if we look back and we find like if we have the gift of mercy or of compassion, we'll find that, oh, I'm just in the mix of people who are suffering and I can comfort them, encourage them. Maybe I have the gift of encouragement. Flip around and you can look back at what the opportunities that you've had and kind of back into, oh, that must be my gift. We should all know what our spiritual gifts are. We all have one, at least one. And not all of us have the same gift. And not everyone has all the gifts. The belief that some cults have that to be born again, you must speak in tongues. You must have the gift of tongues is not biblical. Scripture is very clear that not everyone has any one gift. They vary. That in and of itself on the surface means it's not biblical because not everyone has the gift of tongues. Not everyone has the gift of hospitality. If we don't know our spiritual gifts... To- <laughs> to do some reflection and examination, see what they are, so that we can be in God's plan in using those gifts. Because he has a plan. That's why he gave us the gifts. He's not going to give us the gift and not use it. That would be something else to consider. I have to counsel a brother once who said, I have the gift of helps, and as soon as I pay off this mountain of debt, I'm going to be able to help others financially. And I'm like, I don't think so. If you had the gift of helps you would have the avenue to be able to help somebody financially if that was what you feel your calling is. Sometimes we want to do those things that we don't aren't equipped to because we want to. I mean, it's a good thing. It's good to want to help, but he hasn't called us or equipped us to do that. So we need to seek that out. Next, let's take a look at the opinion of the seekers. Back in the Gospel of John, verse 40, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. We see verse 43 there. So there was a division among the people over him. Leads us to number four in our notes. Not everyone will respond in the same way to hearing the same message. These group of people heard what Jesus said, and yet we see in verse 43, so there was a division among the people over him. The Holy Spirit works and moves in different ways with different people. We've seen how we can share the gospel message with either individuals. We could use the same wording over and over, and the response is different. Or it could be in a group of people. And we see a variety of responses, even amongst the group, when we're saying it all at once. It's the Holy Spirit's work of who is saved. But if we are discerning and we're sensitive to those divine appointments, the Lord can use us. He wants to use us. For any brother or sister who is shying away from sharing their faith, I'm sorry for you because you miss out the blessing of being used by the Lord, even if... And maybe especially when it's rejected. We share the gospel with someone and it's rejected. We have done our part. We have done what the Lord has called us to do. And we don't know what's going on behind the scenes in that person's heart. But we were obedient to the opportunity. In this driven society, and I would include the American church at large, there's this sense of having to close the deal, being a winner of souls. That is so unbiblical. It's unscriptural to say we're a soul winner. 
We don't bring anybody to Christ. The Holy Spirit does. We're just tools to be used by the Lord, but we don't seal the deal. If we do, that person's not saved. It's a work of the Spirit. Then we see in verse 40 and 41, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. Some of them wanted to arrest him. So not only do we see that people don't respond the same way, we see number five, exposure to the gospel will always move people. Exposure to the gospel will always move people closer to Christ, further away, but no one remains unchanged. That's some pretty heavy stuff. When we share the gospel with someone, whether it's the first time or the fifth time that they've heard it, something is different. Something is different than before we said it. That's a truth. And we may not see it. We may not see the movement. We may not see the change in that person. Or we might see something that is opposite than what's actually happening. How many times have we shared the gospel with somebody who is rejected and bristled off and only a few weeks later to say, praise God, I received Jesus as Lord and Savior. When at that moment we shared the gospel, they rejected him. like, I don't know about him. I don't know about her. They, I hope a beer truck doesn't hit him because, you know, how many times have we seen that? Or the flip side, we've shared the gospel and it looks like, oh yeah, they're going to receive Jesus tomorrow. And then two weeks later, they are cursing up a storm and shaking an angry fist at God. Both happen. But if we remember that sharing the gospel always moves somebody, always, closer to Christ or further away, but no one stays the same. No one hears it an additional time and just says, yeah, whatever. No, no, they're being pushed further away or maybe inched a little closer. Verse 41, but some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? I'm repeating that because if you remember, it seems like months ago, in verse 27, during the middle of the week of the celebration, they were asking, can this be the Christ? And the response was, well, when the Christ comes, we don't know where he's coming from. But now, what are they saying two days later? This is only two days from the middle of the week. Now they're saying, isn't the Christ coming from Bethlehem? So it went from, we don't know where he's going to come from, to, wait a minute, he's supposed to come from Bethlehem. Lead us to number six. Sometimes it takes more than one encounter with the gospel truth for seekers who are drawn closer to Christ to repent and believe. Sometimes it takes more than one encounter. The first encounter with the truth, they were like, we don't know where the Christ is coming from. And now two days later, it's the same person, Jesus. And they're saying, well, isn't the Christ supposed to come from Bethlehem? There's movement there. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean we are the ones who are going to be the ones to always give the gospel to that person. I might give the gospel to a person. Another believer comes a week later and they share the gospel with them. And it might take four or five different individuals who don't know one another to share the gospel with that one person before they accept Christ. We can find ourselves having that burden. Like, you know what? I'm going to share the gospel with her until she believes. And if it takes one time, it takes five times, or it takes 30, I'm going to keep sharing the gospel message. How many of us have done that? I've done it. But that's not what the Lord really has called us to do. We share the truth of Christ once in the gospel presentation. After that, we demonstrate that we actually believe it by giving them the love of Christ, sharing the love of Christ with them. Because that's what gives weight to the words. It's our actions. How many times have we shared the gospel with a person, and then a week later, we're kind of tangling up with them, and we're not being righteous with them. We're not demonstrating the love of Christ, even though the week before we were sharing the truth of Christ with them. It goes hand in hand, and the truth of Christ has no meaning for an unbeliever if it's separated from the love of Christ in action. We put that burden on ourselves. When we have to be the one to keep pounding the gospel. I'm going to wear that person down until they accept Christ or they reject me and run off. One or the other is going to happen. And how often does that happen? Far too often. But just know, we see this building up. Every time a person hears the gospel, they are moved. And it could take multiple times. And we don't have to be the one who always shares the gospel with them in word. Verse 45. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? 
The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who has gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. And that brings us to the third element in these verses, and that is the opposition from the scorners. This was not skeptics. These were not, uh, I don't know. They were scorning Christ. They were rejecting him. They were hardened against him and actively against him. In verse 48, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? You know, they paraded themselves as the standard, as the one who is setting the tone and leading, which leads us to number seven. Religious legalists believe that they are infallible and don't make any mistakes. They believe that they're infallible and don't make any mistakes. He can't be the Christ because we say he's not. That's what it comes down to. That verse 48, how could he be the Christ? We would let you know if he was the Christ. We say he's not, therefore he's not. Without ever thinking, well, maybe you're mistaken. Maybe you overlooked something. And religious legalists don't necessarily need to be leaders. We all know of brothers and sisters who are very adamant in their position. They're totally wrong, but they're not in doubt as to what they believe. Verse 49, but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? When the leader said, but this crowd does not know the law is accursed, that's not very kind or loving or considerate. There's a lot of disdain there, which leads us to point number eight. Legalistic leaders elevate themselves over those they have responsibility to care for and are not accountable to the laws they enforce. They're not accountable to their own laws. One rule for thee, another rule for me. That's the heart of a legalistic Pharisee. Now, Nicodemus had to point out, hey, you know, we're supposed to have rules about this. We have a procedure to follow. I find it interesting that they call the people who don't know the law accursed, yet they were the ones who were responsible for teaching and leading them. So in essence, when they called them accursed, they were indicting themselves and their lack of leading and teaching these people. And I've seen that in various churches where the leadership says, oh, well, they can't handle the freedom. They can't process this. We have to guide them. We have to show them what to do. We have to explain it to them. And we can't just let them meet in their houses all by themselves. It's got to be part of a church program because what are they going to do all by themselves? The response should be, well, aren't you teaching them? Aren't you discipling them to be able to gather in a home that's not part of a church ministry program to get together, and and they use the metaphor of the sheep incorrectly. When Jesus refers to his flock as sheep, it's about the shepherd-sheep relationship. It's not about the character of the believer. I'm sure we've all heard prolonged teachings on shepherds and sheep and how dumb sheep are, and then by implication, us as believers. Like, we're so dumb, we can't live our life, we'll hurt ourselves absent the shepherd, Well, the chief shepherd, yes, we will hurt ourselves absent Christ. But this idea that we have to be seeking the pastor or elder to be able to do anything in life denies what we just talked about in the gift of the Savior, the Holy Spirit that lives in each and every one of us. We see that in verse 49, that disdain. They're accursed. They don't even know the law. Well, if they don't know the law and they're accursed, it's because you haven't been doing your job. You have not been equipping God's people. For me, my measure of faithfulness is in your changed lives. Are you more like Christ today than you were a year ago? If not, you may be partially at fault, but I'm going to bear that responsibility before the Lord. I take that burden on. I have the gift of teaching and I share God's word with you and how to apply it. And you take it and you run with it and you seek the spirit. And how does that apply in your personal circumstance this week? But a shepherd should never say, oh, they don't know the law. They're accursed. Any shepherd who says that, any pastor or elder who says, ah, they're just dumb sheep, should step down because their theology is messed up. We all have the Holy Spirit in us who guides and directs us, gives us that discernment to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. 
So we see that. Verse 52, they replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. That leads us to number nine, last point in the outline. The pharisaical mindset does not tolerate a difference of opinion and will aggressively rebuke anyone who is not in agreement with them. It's interesting that Nicodemus said, hey, you know, we got this. And the response was direct. Are you from Galilee too? Implying, is that the reason why? It was kind of an insult on multiple levels. <laughs> you're from Galilee. What can we expect from you? You know, it's like, you're from Paulden. What can we expect from you? <laughs> you no, know, really, you know, it's, it's a similar thing. Maybe, you know. But it's that disdain that comes out. And also, almost implying, well, you know, you're not seeing things clearly. Because you're from Galilee, Jesus is from Galilee. So maybe it's more of a camaraderie thing or a brotherhood thing. You're not really looking at this objectively. Maybe there's some emotion behind it. An accusation that's unfounded. Because all Nicodemus said was point out, well, this is what the law says. Doesn't our law say we should be doing this? Their response is immediate and it's confrontational. It's also interesting to note that they repeat the same mistake as the people because it was convenient for them. The people said, isn't Jesus from Galilee? Well, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And the Pharisees said, well, he's from Galilee too. They repeated the same mistake because it suited their purposes. So they're going to be untruthful and they'll use anything further advance their own agenda. Pharisees didn't believe in Jesus because Jesus didn't go along with their program. If Jesus had come into town and said, you know, Pharisees, you're right on, and I am the Messiah, and I'm the Son of God, and I'm here, and you've been doing a great job, but now it's my time to take over and show you how to go, they would have fallen right in line. Fall right in line. If he was going to give them the rewards and awards and the proclamations and acclamations that they believe they deserve, they'd be all over Jesus. But because he came in with the Father's plan, with the Father's will, not theirs, because theirs had gone off the rails, they rejected him. That's the reason. And I'll just close with this thought. It's not cliche to say that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's truth. We often recite that verse, and it can lose some of its impact and meaning, and just become kind of background thought, but it's true. He does resist the proud, but he gives grace upon grace to the humble. Please agree with me in prayer. Lord, we do thank you that you have saved us, that you allowed circumstances in our life to bring us to the end of ourselves, to strip away the, the lie of the enemy that we are self-sufficient, that we have all the answers, that we can get ourselves out of the pit that we found ourselves in. Thank you for opening the eyes of our heart to the truth that without you, we are helpless and hopeless. But with you, we have everything. We have total and complete forgiveness of our sin. We have a home in heaven. We don't look at death the same way as those who are unbelievers. Lord, we're not rushing to come home to you, but we don't have that fear. We don't have that fear because we know, we don't just believe, but we know when we breathe our last here, we will stand before you in your throne room, in heaven, no more pain, no more sorrow, but to be face to face with our Savior, the one who loves us perfectly. We want to be obedient to your word here on earth. We want to do the things that you have called us and equipped us to do. Because when we are face to face with you, we desire to hear the phrase, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, to hear that from you would be an amazing blessing upon blessing. And so that's what drives us to be obedient to you, to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others as well. So Lord, we do hope and pray that we will have opportunities this week to share the truth of Christ with the love of Christ, with those who need to hear it and need to see it in our actions, even when we think no one's looking, and especially when we think no one is looking, that we are faithful and obedient to you. Thank you, Lord, for uh, this time of studying your word, fellowship with our brothers and sisters. May you get great glory and, and those around us be abundantly blessed by the things we say and do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.